we're kicking off the show again with news of Japan hosting joint air drills around its territory over the weekend. Last week, it was Japan and Taiwan coordinating coast guards for search and rescue. And this week, it's Japan's Air Self-Defense Force conducting joint exercises with Germany, France, and Spain. So we've got more drills signaling increased deterrence from Chinese aggression, but this time Japan's partners are from Europe rather than regional neighbors. So take this in any direction you want, Miles, but clearly there's a unique significance to Europe's increased presence here. Japan is one of the first countries in Asia that realized the, the global nature of the China threat. So mm. you know there was a slogan that said, think globally, act locally. Uh, Japan, think and act globally, uh, <laughs> and locally in this case. Within a matter of like uh, five years, Japan has transformed itself from a regional security power to a global security leader uh, for several reasons. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, uh, China threat is gone global. Yeah. As such, uh, there is a need for a global response, and Japan is leading that in that part of the world. Uh, secondly, it has something to do with the U.S. defense umbrella. Japan, for decades, since 1950s, rely almost exclusively on the defense umbrella provided by the United States, uh, by the rock-solid uh, mutual defense uh, treaty. That is very important still. It's very crucial for Japan's security, but it's not enough. Because yeah. United States, a big country, is a global country, has a lot of burden sharing issues over there. So in the last four or five years, Japan uh, has uh, paid more attention to defense self-reliance, strengthening uh, its own defense capabilities uh, build up. As such, you see this uh, Abe Kishida revolution in military affairs in Japan. Prime Minister Kishida, a couple of years ago, announced this uh, stunning turn around in Japan's uh, defense posturing, changing Japan's uh, defense posturing from purely defensive to focusing on developing uh, counter-strike and even preemptive strike capabilities. That's pretty amazing. And Japan, yeah. uh, under Kishida administration, also says it's going to increase its defense budget and raise it to 2% uh, of its GDP. Under normal circumstances for decades, uh, that would have been a, a big, big source of national uproar because Japanese constitution even said Japanese defense budget should never exceed 1% uh, of the GDP. But this time, the Japanese country, Japanese nation uh, uh, has gone along with the uh, Prime Minister Kishida. One of the most important reasons is that uh, because the whole of Japan feels the acute threat posed by China. You know, China's unfavorability among Japanese uh, citizens is above 90%. Think about that. Really? <laughs> yeah, really? That's pretty high. One of the major uh, hallmarks of Kishida cabinet's defense restructuring is uh, to forge a much closer alliance with NATO. Yeah. NATO is a multilateral collective defense pact whose primary focus was on European security. But because of the threat, has gone global because of the coming together of Russia and China. So this global source of instability has gone uh, transcontinental. So that's why after Prime Minister Kishida's announcement of his defense ambition, the first stop he visited was not Washington, but Brussels. And NATO, of course, has responded to this with uh, uh, enthusiasm, I might say, uh, with the possible exception of French. Uh, French have always been French. So uh, <laughs> NATO Secretary uh, General Stoltenberg has embraced Japan's uh, uh, approach uh, to NATO. And uh, uh, I think there is a, a lot of uh, closer and closer exercise in interoperability among NATO countries and Japanese defense forces. That's why you see this uh, pattern uh, is developing very fast. And we talk about the Japan-Taiwan Maritime Corporation last week. But this time, yep. you have yep. the key allies uh, of the United States in Europe, Germany, France, and Spain, uh, conducting joint exercises in Japan. So this is unprecedented. I think it's the beginning of a emerging pattern. Yeah. Well, and as you illustrated, I think it's pretty obvious where the urgency for Japan comes from. Um, I mean, the threat is right at their doorstep. But this was, for their European partners, this was Spain's first time sending jets to Japan and only Germany's second time. So 
you don't hear Spain's name very often in these type of exercises. And Germany has economic entanglement with China. So what what gives? What's behind the new Western urgency? I think there is a growing consensus among Western allies, particularly NATO countries, that uh, China's threat uh, is also uh, a threat to them. It's not uh, several thousand miles away. Yeah. Uh, you look at the, uh, just uh, the other day, Russia and China are conducting joint bomber patrol off the coast of Alaska. I mean, Alaska mm, is uh, basically, yeah. you know, it's a, a, in the right, uh, Pacific. Right. But once again, Russia is a European country. Russia also is an Asian country. So that's a linkage. And China has conducted joint military exercises in Belarus, of all places. What you're talking about is uh, a rejoin of the lines between dictatorship and freedom. And it's a Western democracy versus autocracy. So this line is getting clearer, and uh, we should uh, embrace the reality. Reality is not just about trade. It's also about security. Without security, without peace, trade would not exist. Have, have we seen any probably predictable responses from Xi Jinping or uh, the Chinese leadership to these drills? I mean, they do some some uh, joint exercises with Russia. I mean, Russia and China, uh, for the first time, conducted joint naval exercises in the South China Sea, for example. Okay. But okay. Russia was sort of dragged into this because Russia had uh, uh, because Russia has to consider the feelings of its uh, traditional allies in that region, particularly Vietnam. So China is more gung ho about this. Uh, I think there is still some opportunities left for the West to uh, engage Russia, uh, mostly from a security point of view. But it will be very hard because Russia's Far East is also very vulnerable for Chinese aggression as well. Yeah, Nobody knew this better than Vladimir Putin uh, until probably very recently. And he got <laughs> uh, uh, sanctioned so heavily that he was pushed to the Chinese camp. But Putin is very good at, plays, uh, at playing balance of power. Uh, he knew that uh, he's not going to uh, put his eggs in the China basket. That's why he reached out to North Korea, to Vietnam, and to other countries as well, to counterbalance China's preponderance of influence. Uh, well, that brings us to our second topic today, which is a new region for the China Insider podcast, I believe, which is the Arctic. So you sent me an article from Newsweek that was reporting on some suspect Chinese activity in the Arctic. But anyone who can glance at a map would recognize that China has no direct land access to the Arctic. So twofold question here. What arrangement has been set up to bring China into the great polar power struggle? And also, what interest does China have there in the first place? China's strenuous efforts to march into the Arctic region fits very well into the overall PRC strategy. Hmm. That is, PRC basically view the world uh, into predominantly two camps. One is the oppressors, another one is the oppressed. The United States is a leading pack, leading power of the pack uh, of the oppressors. China is the uh, primary victim and representing the oppressed. So this is China's very Cold War-like uh, mentality, which is uh, really, really strange in today's world. However, in the last five, six years, China has developed a third domain besides the oppressor versus the oppressed. And what is that? That third domain is what China called the Xinjiang Yu, which literally translated into new frontiers. Okay. So what it means is uh, China say, okay, the world is pretty much uh, occupied by the two camps, right? Uh, the Western yep. dominance in some key parts of the world. And also there's a vast area represented by the oppressed. But however, there's also a lot of domains that nobody has claimed predominance, right? Either oppressor or the oppressed. Those new domains would include uh, undersea, space, cyber, and polar. So there's mm. no sovereignty. There's no preponderance of influence in these areas. And yeah. so first come, first serve. China basically is now rushing in at a dizzy speed to occupy those uh, domains to make the claim of a right to these new frontiers. Oh, that's interesting. Polar is an essential part of that Chinese new strategy. 
that's one new frontier. So China must control because there's no predominance of inference in this area. As you mentioned, Arctic is you know nearly a thousand miles away from China. Yeah. So China created this uh, this a uh, phony new concept called the Near Arctic State. Uh, that means that China claims itself as a near Arctic state. <laughs> that's that's this, generous. This uh, concept is a little bit strange because if that's the case, you are like nearly a thousand miles away. There are so many countries that could claim that. Even Saudi right. Arabia could say, you know, he is a near Arctic state. <laughs> this is in the middle of the <laughs> Now, Arctic region, of course, is governed by the Arctic Council, which consists of eight countries, including countries like Norway, uh, Sweden, uh, Finland, United States, Canada, Iceland, and Russia. And China is never part of that. So it will be harder for China to march into Arctic uh, without facing a lot of resistance. However, in Antarctica, where there's no major powers around, China's march into Antarctica is really unhinged. Um, they're pretty big uh, deal there. They do a lot huh. of uh, send a lot of teams go to Antarctica. Leading the the efforts was uh, uh, China's big icebreaker. Uh, it's called the Snow Dragon, Xue Long. Now this Snow Dragon was built by Ukrainians. Now, as I said before, Ukrainians were crucial for China's uh, military modernization. Yeah, and this is another example. This is a twenty ton. Icebreaker built uh, by the Kherson shipyard in Ukraine. China bought it, retrofitted, uh, add a lot of gears over there. Some of them surveillance, some of them pretty high tech satellite tracking stuff. So they go to Antarctica all the time. Yeah, I might also want to add that uh, uh, for a long time, United States, obviously being a global power, has paid a relatively little attention to Arctic region, although we are a member of the Arctic Council until during the Trump administration. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo went to Arctic Council in 2019 and delivered a very powerful speech exposing China's ambition for the Arctic. At that time, 2019, people thought that America just want to pick on China. And so yeah. very few people believe in us. Now everybody did. Everybody does uh, because uh, that's a far sight that few other countries would have at the time. Right now, we are pushing back against China's uh, ambition in an uh, Arctic region, and uh, we in that speech, Secretary Pompeo made a very strong point against the ridiculous concept of a China's claim of being near Arctic state. I love that. So you talk about it being part of this larger new frontiers strategy, but specifically the Arctic and the polar region. What are what are China's specific interests there? China's interest uh, in, Ar in the Arctic region are enormous. Uh, number one, it's, uh, China sees as, uh, uh, this region as invaluable to its military ambition, global military conquest. Mm. Arctic region uh, can set up uh, ground tracking stations for China's uh, military satellites and its uh, missile uh, launchings and, uh, and the laser installations. So China wants to set up the ground radar and and uh, laser installations, also listening posts. Uh, and those are all key to China's growing long-range strike capability. So militarily yeah. speaking, it's very important for China. It's a, it's a forward operating footprint. That's exactly right, exactly right. Yeah. And it, China saw this, uh, this vacuum because during the Cold War, the United States did have a very strong military presence there. We had a very big uh, Air Force base, for example, in Iceland. Uh, now yeah. uh, uh, we're not there anymore. So China saw this uh, vacuum; they want to uh, fill in. Secondly, China see Arctic region as a crucial linkage with Russia, because yeah. uh, 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 it, as a key cooperation link with Russia. Russia mm -hmm. faces a lot of Arctic Council's resistance for its uh, aggrandizement. Uh, Vladimir Putin wants to restore the Soviet era predominance in the Arctic region. He activated the Arctic Brigade, for example, militarized this, this uh, uh, rather peaceful uh, area. China joining Russia to counter the West in the Arctic along with Russia. So this is basically you know, two uh, aggressive nations joining hands. This is very important for, for, for both countries. Now, of course, there's also Arctic region is very important. Uh, most of the countries in the Arctic regions are not really China's friends. Some of them have even become China's adversaries. Yeah. Yeah. Norway, for example, Chinese-Norwegian relationship took a nosedive 
after the Norway Nobel Committee granted the Nobel Prize for Peace for the Chinese dissident Liu Xiaobo, and China went berserk, uh, cut off its, its uh, uh, salmon trade and uh, gave some harsh treatment to its, uh, Norway's uh, diplomats, and also Sweden, another country, China kidnapped a Swedish citizen, citizen from a neutral country, uh, I believe in Thailand, and mm. uh, sentenced him to death. This guy is still in jail. And the aftermath of the diplomatic uh, uh, struggle between Sweden and China totally turned the peace-loving Swedish government and its people against China. So if you, if you conduct a public opinion poll in, in Sweden about China, the numbers are very, very high, around the 80s, 80%, right? And also another key member in the Arctic Council is Canada. Now, Canada used to be very friendly to China. And until several years ago, during the Trump administration, Canada arrested a Chinese uh, uh, law-breaking business official uh, for Huawei. And uh, that's when uh, China retaliated by arresting two Canadians living in China and sent them to death. Uh, threatening the Canadians, Jeez. so Canada turned sour to to uh, uh, on on China, and of course yeah. the United States is a member of the Arctic Council. That's why China wants to increase its influence and status in the Arctic uh, regions, and uh, to use its uh, uh, influence, uh, particularly financial and infrastructure uh, capability, to influence those countries to improve the relationships. Uh, and also another thing is economic interest. China's economic interest uh, in the Arctic region is also very, very uh, ambitious. China eyes Arctic region's uh, minerals, fishing, bioprospecting, and potentially new uh, sea routes. Uh, obviously, that's a, yeah. uh, a new thing. If, if uh, the Arctic region's uh, new route is open, that would dramatically shorten the voyages between China and the European market. And of course, there's a science. Arctic region, the air is very pure, is very good to conduct space science uh, and uh, bioenvironmental research too. So there are a lot of Chinese scientists who are also interested in that area too. Well, if I've learned nothing else in this episode, I learned that Washington, D.C. is a near Arctic city, uh, which, <laughs> which is good. No, I think uh, Miami is too. Yeah, right, right, right. The whole region, really. So to close us out, our third topic is surrounding the recent global IT outage, thanks to the now well-known CrowdStrike update. However, it seems China on the whole was largely unaffected. This logically makes sense, since they are often using non-US systems. But I know there's more going on here, Miles, for you to include this in our lineup today. So what do you want to tell us about this? I think what you referred to was the internet uh, uh, meltdown globally couple of weeks ago, and China was the only country that was not significantly impacted at all. So yeah. which, uh, which raised a lot of speculation about whether China is culpable. Uh, of course, China is culpable. Mm. So, uh, and if you look at the country, China has built this uh, greatest firewall in human history, completely cut off its own citizen from the rest of the world. So China's internet uh, activities, sponsored by the government, consists of two parts. One is defensive, and the other one is offensive. Now, the defensive part, obviously, is a firewall. So if you're a Chinese citizen today, you will not have access to the following uh, international news organizations. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, the Bloomberg News, BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, Reuters, Yahoo News, and Voice of America. So. Basically, you do not have uh, access to the Western uh, uh, media reports, right? But if you say Western media is kind of all woke and then probably the better for the Chinese <laughs> not to have it. <laughs> I mean, think about this. Not only that, social media and the communication platforms were almost entirely denied to the Chinese people. Now, if you're a Chinese citizen living in China today, you will not have access to the following. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, and you will not have access to Google Search, Gmail, Google Drive, and Google Maps. You definitely do not have access to YouTube. And you do not have access to Wikipedia, Dropbox, and Slack. 
Now think about as a person living in a free and democratic country like the United States, you do not have access to those things. What your life will be like? Yeah, right. So that's defensive. It, it, China has created a completely separate cyber world. Cutting yeah. off its citizen from the rest of the world. That's why the Chinese Communist propaganda is so effective because there is no alternative frame of references to any news events, right? So that's a defensive part. That's a great firewall. Now there's yeah. also a offensive part of the Chinese cyber capability. That is, China is the world's number one hacking country. There's no close second. The Chinese hacking is absolutely uh, effective and state-sponsored. It hacked Canada in 2014. Canada's National Research Council was hacked by a highly sophisticated Chinese state-sponsored actor. And then in 2020, Australian government uh, was uh, hacked by a sophisticated state-sponsored cyber hack that's from China. And then in 2022, India... Uh, who's a key lab and a security apparatus was hacked by the Chinese state-sponsored uh, hacking group. And they go back to 2010, right after Norway gave uh, the Chinese dissident Liu Xiaobo the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Norwegian uh, uh, were hacked. And uh, they are, uh, uh, they're, they're part of the broader pattern of the cyber activities against uh, entities perceived as opposed to the Chinese uh, 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 interest. England, the United Kingdom, was hacked by uh, Chinese hackers in 2015. And that cyber attack against England is against uh, target, uh, British telecom giant, the British Airways, uh, and potentially uh, getting uh, a lot of data st uh, stolen uh, by the millions uh, of customers. So uh, UK's uh, National Cyber Security Center was also uh, hacked at some point. In 2015 as well, Germany, uh, uh, German Chancellor, German Chancellor Angela Merkel's office and other German government entities that were also hacked by Chinese hackers from China. Now, China built Africa, a gigantic headquarters of, of African Union in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. That African Union headquarters was hacked by China uh, between 2012 and 2017 for five years. And this was released, actually revealed by Wikipedia, uh, WikiLeaks, right? This is uh, uh, insane. African Union, also by uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, and we know our European Union was also hacked in, as far er earlier uh, as 2011. So those are offensive. Of course, the United States has become a prime target of Chinese hacking activities. Right. Uh, OPM record. And the insurance companies, yep, yep. and the Equifax breach, and Marriott Hotels re customer registration, and so all this hacking, China is expert on that. That's why, if you understand China's hacking capabilities, you will not really be surprised. A couple of weeks ago, during the global IT meltdown, China was virtually exempt, immune to that kind of uh, disaster. 在今日华尔街频道的六度解析中更重要的是将它们串联起来加入今日华尔街的六度解析